Broadway, New York, the home of entertainment, the appropriate location for one of the decade's most awaited movies, Superman 2. All the stars flew in for a memorable first night. Terry Stamp, more genial than General Zod, and Gene Hackman, once again the lethal Lex Luthor. Jack O'Halloran, the silent lumbering non, and the third villain of Krypton, the glamorous Sarah Douglas. All committed to the downfall of Superman, a role now associated with Christopher Reeve. At a star-studded opening night, the cast and their friends danced the night away. Henry Kissinger, Princess Caroline of Monaco, and Sergeant Shriver were just a few of the fans to come along. Carolyn Kennedy and Arnold Schwarzenegger stayed till dawn, and so did Gene Hackman. For producers Elias Salkind and Pierre Spengler, at last the moment to forget the worries of a multi-million dollar production, and for you at home, a chance to find out how they actually made Superman 2. Hi, I'm Christopher Reeve. As you can see, for the principal actors and the director, Making a movie isn't over when the camera stops running. But we weren't just partying for our own benefit. Both Superman premieres were in aid of the Special Olympics program for the mentally retarded. You know, in the old uh, studio days, the Hollywood moguls were anxious to preserve the mystique of the movies. They wanted you to believe that, uh, well, actors just made up the plot as they went along, and all you really needed to make a movie was a handful of stars. Gradually, that's changed, though. People have become aware of the writer, the director, Sometimes even the cameraman is written about. And on the Superman films, we have those people, and more, many more. A team of hundreds of technicians, all skilled in one particular aspect of modern movie making. And one of the reasons we wanted to show you this hour of behind the scenes secrets of Superman 2 is to applaud their talents. But before you make a movie, one thing's essential. You have to have a good idea. For years now, one of the highlights of the annual Cannes Film Festival has been the fly-past of planes, bringing the news of the Superman saga. The initial idea of making the American hero into a major motion picture was that of Elias Salkind. He persuaded his father, Alexander, to back it, which was easier said than done. Well, the first uh, is, uh, uh, endeavor is to put uh, the package together. I mean, to find the story, find the right actors for the story, the right director, put all that together. Secondly, you have to find also the finance to make it happen, which is less, less amusing, but very necessary. What have we done to top part one? I think that what we've done is to, to unify the style of the picture a bit more. Um, Part one, we had the we had the the uh, obligation to tell the backstory, all the history, to take you all the way to Canada and growing up and all that kind of stuff, which was fine. It was lovely, but now we've done the exposition, and I think people will enjoy seeing that we start off with action from the first frame. You know, it's just boom. <laughs> basic problem was that the first film, people went to it and said, Proved, prove that a man can fly. Director Richard Lester. They go to the second film saying, of course the people can fly, now show us something. Villains of Krypton, now free from the Phantom Zone, embark on a life of ruthless crime. They are led by General Zod, played by Terry Stamp. And I play General Zod like a galactic Hitler, you know, terribly serious, 
doesn't have any, he doesn't have any humor at all himself. Zod's accomplices are the bear-like Non, played by Jack O'Halloran, and the cold-hearted Ursa. A powerful joint Soviet-American space capsule is like a plaything in the hands of the giant Non, who is eager to please his lethal master. Non worships Zod. Worships, I mean, do anything, yes, anything. Just beat me, but look at me, you know. And, and the same with Ursa, and that's what, I mean, Zod gets off on that. He doesn't want uh, argument and uh, disagreement. He wants uh, unconditional admiration. That's what Zod's into. English actress Sarah Douglas plays Ursa. She is evil. She doesn't make any bones about it, but I think it's the innocence in it. It's the innocence of discovering her powers. It's, it is just part of her. That is her trait. She is evil. Well, I tried to, that, that whatever she did, she did hoping that, that Zod would see it and congratulate her for it. And Non spent all his time desperately trying like a, like a large dog to be useful and and to and and to have praise it takes little time for the terrible 3 to penetrate the heart of the free world the white house once again an elite army of stuntmen take on the spectacular action of a superman film On screen, it will take Non a couple of seconds to throw a man through a wall. On the studio floor, it's a subtle piece of choreography that takes hours. Even in the world of make-believe, limbs can easily be broken unless the move is carried out with exact timing and the stunt completed with an accuracy that can be measured in millimeters. The president's bodyguards may have had their bad moments in the past, but never before have they had to contend with a foe that's bulletproof, indestructible, and not the nicest aliens you'd wish to meet. Zod is the bad apple, you know, he's the big bad apple. I don't want him to be a multifaceted character. He should be absolutely predictable. Non has an irritating habit of never bothering to use the doorknob. Perhaps they don't have them on Krypton. And having entered the inner sanctum, the Oval Office, General Zod displays a total disregard for the dignity of earthly politicians and, for that matter, everybody else. No, he doesn't have any respect for anybody on Earth. I mean, he doesn't even, he doesn't look at anybody. Having been imprisoned a great time, he, uh, he's freed and finds a place where the opposition is puny and therefore he seems to have a great opportunity to rule and the way that you attempt to rule is you subjugate your people by fear. I'll kneel before you if it will save lives. It will, starting with your own. What I do now, I do for the sake of the people of the world. But there is one man here on Earth who will never kneel before you. Who is this imbecile? Where is he? I wish I knew.
The one man who will never kneel is in his earthly disguise of Clark Kent. Christopher Reeve has been on the Superman set for three years now. It's become a way of life. And Margot Kidder is back as the scoop-hungry reporter Lois Lane. Director Lester closely involves Reeve and Miss Kidder in plotting the action. When it comes to characterization, Christopher Reeve surprisingly finds the role of Clark Kent a more intriguing challenge than Superman. In the long run, I would probably say Clark. I don't know why, but I sort of feel more affinity for him, as though uh, his condition is more universal. I mean, there's only one of those guys with blue and red boots who flies around, and that's fine as a fantasy figure, but it's been more interesting to try to try to play with Clark, you know, and try to make him a little bit unpredictable and make him recognizable. And uh, I think his dilemma of really desperately wanting to reveal who he is and not being able to is, I don't know, ident identifiable. I, it's a little harder to relate from so to somebody from outer space. So Clark's more fun in the long run. I always get the feeling with, with the way he plays it, that it is an act, that it is Superman putting on an act for people. There is always a knowing quality that he is, he is behaving, he's under, he is Superman, a man under control, who is playing partially the part of a buffoon. I really did it to her, didn't I? That's a hell of a shot. Does it bother you at all that we played it sort of more over here? No. You can get it around that, okay? Yeah, I couldn't tell. And also, what about the speed that I was going at? It seemed to be no more than about sort of 15 miles an hour. Can you do that much damage in 15 miles an hour? When you hit a brick wall, yes. Okay. I think if you do it any less, it won't So you won't see the fact that I was actually doing that, right? No, sir. Okay. You know, less than that, it isn't funny. No, no. But that's funny for me. So it's a little, what we do is you cut to the private anguish of the cab driver. That's right. <laughs> he's, he comes out and goes... <laughs> it's one of those. And everybody yeah. else, typical New York, is like... Eh, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. Most, right. most New York cabs look right. like that when you get yeah, in. Right. Jake! A Superman film requires more draftsmen than it takes to plan a small town. The attention to detail is incredibly meticulous. The process of creating a widescreen epic requires a blend of many ideas. Once the writers, David and Leslie Newman, have written a scene in the script, it is then the job of director Lester to see how he can make it visual. Long before the camera turns over or indeed any sets are built, their joint visions are mapped out in literally hundreds of thousands of drawings. For instance, the art department made more drawings of the Eiffel Tower for a four-minute scene than Alexander Gustav Eiffel did in 1886 when he built it. There may be only one Superman always seen in the same familiar outfit, but to ensure his costume is spotless, he keeps a few spares. Not only that, each cape is specifically designed to accommodate whatever maneuver he is carrying out. Taking off, flying, landing, or just striding along the street. Everything is on a super scale in this film. Editor John Victor Smith has plenty of film to choose from for his final assembly, more than two million feet. That's enough to stretch from New York to Boston and back again. Each element of the scene very often has to be shot separately. I would be perhaps putting the actor in 
for a certain shot, the background would have to be shot by uh, another unit transferred into, made into a, a cinematic plate that would then be projected onto a screen. Uh, then perhaps a model, part of a model shot would be added to the, the space around the actor. This area here, that is original, which we shot on the floor some weeks ago. Sometimes now, the vast sets aren't vast enough. Ivor Beddoes paints a glass surround for the Fortress of Solitude. It's known as a mat shot. So I've got to put on parts of it which never exist on the set. The plot of Superman II involved the villains arriving at the Daily Planet in Metropolis, or New York as we know it, and then taking a large bite out of the Big Apple. Clearly, it would prove impossible to shoot scenes of mayhem in the streets and skies of Manhattan. So a detailed New York skyline was constructed in miniature, 3,000 miles away in Pinewood, England. Every building had its own elaborate lighting systems, this time immune from the blackout that interrupted the shooting on Superman 1. The modern moviegoer is now more than ever on the lookout for crafty model shots, so the ingenuity of the filmmaker is stretched as never before. The shots of this street will never last more than a few seconds, yet every car has its own working headlights. Here we go now, black and white duck. So not moving, Peter, just lights on. It would be a perfect but expensive Christmas present for a lucky child. Richard Lester's role is as much master coordinator as director. It's a question of accurate micro-planning. I think the difference between this kind of film and a normal film is that you have to, in certain key sequences, uh, which are basically the, the big special effects sequences, know in advance precisely what you want done. Therefore, you, you write them very carefully, you storyboard them, and that is that you draw every frame, and Everyone working on the film has a copy of the storyboard, which is a great book of uh, drawings. And in each of the drawings um, shows precisely in what direction a person moves, how far it moves, and how long the shot will last. And in each camera, we put a little grid so that we know we can break up into a whole series of 64 squares precisely where everyone is in, in every frame. And then so that when all these bits of film are superimposed upon each other, it will look like one shot. Even learning how to fly was a, a thing that kept me busy for a long time. Um, the, the, the problems of front projection, uh, the problems of, of, of mirrors and things, you know, that's been an education. Now, in the studio for Superman 2, other techniques are tested and tried. It's a cruel ordeal for the actors who are balanced high on the pole arm for hours at a time. A new camera was invented and then adapted in the quest to put realism into the flying. It has to be able to dive and rotate, simulating flying itself, and also it has to be able to project film and shoot simultaneously. Monitoring the shots on video, the flying unit tries to ensure that both the projected background and the actors move in a coordinated manner. So the result looks as authentic as if they were speeding through the skies. Back on Earth, editors John Victor Smith and Peter Watson carefully try to plot in a foreground so Superman will seem to hurtle through the stars. So, um, it comes in from right. It comes in right to left. 
Do, do, do you think oh, no, we can't get away till his feet are in? No, his arm is the last to go in. Yeah. Um, take a bit further until his arm's in. Now, from now on, this is the first frame. frame. Yeah, I'll frame. mark that. Yeah, he's well clear there, isn't he? I'll mark that frame. Yeah. When he's totally in. You can start reducing yeah. gently and possibly now, as he goes off. Yeah. Maybe same. against the bright side of the, the bright bit of the moon. Right? Yes, which is will help us. And now we have to also start panning left. Yeah, yeah, yeah to, to, to hold him. Up. Yeah, to yes. hold him going towards that. We hold. We can hold him right until he exits frame. Yes. Right till then, yeah. Yes. But we haven't told you everything about flying. For instance, how did they manage to get these five actors to weave in and out of the pillars of the Fortress of Solitude as if they were fish underwater? Yes. Ah. Hey, ever heard of parachutes? The writers of Superman 2 needed to pit the Man of Steel against the most powerful natural elements that the Earth could provide. What better than the world's greatest waterfall, the Niagara Falls? Keep going, keep going. But before Superman could swoop through the cascading torrent, the film crew had to perform some spectacular work as well. It was essential to anchor a camera and its operators high in the sky, 500 feet above the potentially lethal Niagara waters. The camera crew needed cool heads, one false step, and you're somewhere under the rainbow. Did you get that? Uh, the cage anti-clock. Come in again. If you do have the misfortune to fall, there's only one man on Earth who can save you. There you go. I'm sorry. Only one ride to a customer. Superman! Bye. Superman, it's me! Bye. At Niagara, Margot Kidder and Chris Reeve meet some of the fans they made with Superman 1. No hint of the isolated superstar here. It's a, it's a really nice place to work, though. He wants to shake your hand. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, Margot has to jump over the railing, not into the water, but onto the mattress where her stunt double is resting. It would be too dangerous to ask even an experienced stunt woman to jump into these vicious waters. So, with the no-expense-spared planning that characterizes the Superman film, the base of Niagara Falls was recreated on the back lot at Pinewood. Lois Lane's double is wearing the olive green trouser suit and pink t-shirt. The camera is poised above her. Even in these waters, it's a tough fall, but she hits the target dead on. Now let's see that jump cut into the final film. Don't blink. You think I'm Superman? <laughs> Boy, you certainly have some imagination, Lois. <laughs> For a minute there, you almost had me convinced. For a minute. 
But Margot Kidder still had to endure some close-ups herself. At least the way I normally operate is let the stuntman do it as a take, obviously using wide-angle lenses so that you don't see that it's a stuntman, to go through all the procedure for the actor to sit and watch it and say, this is what happens. Then the stuntman comes out and reports where the dangerous areas are, where in the water I, am I? You find that when you pass that rock, you're being pulled out by the current. You've got to be very careful there. Um, th this is the dangerous area. This, it's dangerous when you start shouting for help, you may swallow too much water, whatever it is. Then you say, look, let's try just a small piece with the actor and maybe put them on a rope or something to protect them. Let's try them in slightly calmer water. But you have to do it gradually, A, to build up their confidence, but build, to build up my confidence that there is no actual danger because in the end, it's only a film. And the thought of, of hurting anyone or, or any animal or anything while you're shooting a film is absolutely obscene. It's just monstrous. So you cannot allow that to happen. And the one thing that you must learn when you're making action films is that no matter in what hurry you are, how much money you're losing while you wait, that you dare not rush a stuntman. Because he, 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 with us, it's only money. But with them, it's their life. And, and certainly the same thing applies when an actor is determined to do his own stunt. It wasn't only the actors who took some risks on Superman 2. The producers took a big gamble in having Superman actually fall in love. Superman now, having been prepared really for everything in life, everything he'd have to face on Earth, he's now finding out about his heart. He's now finding out about what love is, is doing to change him. And that's another part of the movie I think is very important. So what do you think? You like it? Like it? It's incredible. I mean, uh, not that it couldn't use a woman's touch, you know, especially around dinner time. Dinner? Oh, I'm sorry. See, I don't usually do too much about... Listen, tonight, sky's the limit. Anything you want. It was a risk if, in fact, it had been, as it was originally written, that it was Superman with all his faculties and powers in bed with, it, with a human being. I think that is... Uh, an amusing risk, but a ri certainly a risk. Here, cheers. Cheers. For the first time in my life, everything's clear. Well, it was important that uh, the eternal love story between uh, Superman and Lois uh, does come to a conclusion. The big problem was to, to, to respect the audience of uh, children. And I think the way it comes in the film, it uh, works because there is absolutely no feeling, I think, of any kind of uh, vulgarity or, or any kind of... Uh, I, you know, there's so many words I could use here, but any anything uh, unpleasant for children. Mark McClure is photographer Jimmy Olsen, not quite a child, but the youngest member of Perry White's staff. And Perry himself is once again portrayed by the former child star, Jackie Cooper. So from the beginning, it goes now. Now, right. I can't understand it. Where is he? I mean, he shows up every time a cat gets stuck in a tree. I tried to write a series, or reshape the existing screenplay so that there was always every other scene or every third scene so little special effects within that sequence that the actors could perform in a naturalistic manner <laughs> oh sorry you were you weren't here uh, could you see the the, the um 
the um, you see Daily Planet sign? Uh, up up top there, there's a there's a little sign. Cross. Oh. I'll, I'll go find it. Excuse me. Yeah. And I shot them in a normal, relaxed manner with no marks on the floor and and freedom to change lines and 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 perform in a, in a way where they were not restricted in any way by camera movements or positions or grids within the cameras. That's too long. Yeah, it's too long. Yeah, really. And I think you, could, well, you, you, uh, you need a very, a very steady move, move across so that he can, he can watch it. Richard, yes, sir. suppose I don't... Suppose I finish the game plan speech, watch. Mm -hmm. Let's start from the beginning. Right. Right. And then notice it. Um, Ready? <laughs> David? Yeah. Turn. Action. I can't understand it. Where is he? I mean, he shows up every time a cat gets stuck in a tree, and now he decides to pull a disappearing act. Uh, you know, maybe we just haven't figured out his game plan. Game plan? It's fourth down. The two-minute warning has sounded, and the ball's deep in our territory. How brilliant do you have to be? Well, Superman's got something up his sleeve, that's for sure. We just haven't figured it out, right, Miss Wayne? He'll be here. If there's any way at all, he'll be here. See? And she knows his plays better than anybody. Yeah, better than anybody. <laughs> Gene Hackman is once again Lex Luthor. With all this accumulated knowledge, when will these dummies learn to use a doorknob? Uh, I, I like to seem as as being playful, even though uh, it's written in the script he is a villain. Uh, I don't know how to play a villain because you know villains really. Uh, for my experience of, of uh, as an actor is that you can't really you can only play what's in you. Finally, uh, if you play beyond that then it becomes false or becomes like a comic uh, book character. I, I can only, you know, if, if he's villainous, it's what he says from the script. It isn't, it isn't that I'm going to sneer and uh, people are going to hiss at me. Hi. I, uh, you should see the White House. I've been cleaning for months. Lex Luthor. Well, I've learned I've learned uh, things about films that actors really don't need to know. <laughs> I mean, like uh, how blue backing works and things like that, which I might have been better off not knowing. But it certainly has killed the time. It's helped it to go faster. I've been here for nearly three years, you know, and I've enjoyed learning about how a model works and about how the difference between putting on a 75 versus a 40. When you're turning, do you ever let it go and catch it Something like that? Yeah, yeah. How can you catch it without getting a bump on it? You know, without getting a hit. Yeah. I don't mind so much when you sit See, but if you spin, if you spin very hard, you're going to get a, um, you're going to get a hit as you stop it. For Christopher Reeve, the Superman set is sometimes better than attending film school. Anyway, thank you very much for this. The Fortress of Solitude had to be completely rebuilt for Superman 2. One of the main scenes is when Superman renounces his powers and gets destructured. Right. Any last words before you get destructured? Right. Set it quiet on stage. Talk to my agent. Contrary to all rumors, we will be turning sound on this one. I'd like to hear the rehearsal. I'd much rather make the all-American movie in England than anywhere else because in the States everyone's going, wow, hey, wait a minute, that's not Superman, you're not doing it right. You know, there's five, you know, five uh, grips that can and think they know the part better than you do. Over here they don't know so much about Superman and so they'll say, well, yeah, I guess he's all right, I guess he's all right. You know, and I find it's a less critical crew, a less, they're more sympathetic because they don't have the overexposure to Superman. Um, that there is in the States. It's not part of the folklore. Uh, feel much more of a sense of freedom. Right. Action, Chris. And I'm walking and I'm walking. Right. 
door. Being hurled backwards holds all the terrors of flying for Terence Stamp and more. In fact, it's quite dangerous. And if, you, if your mind is wandering and you're up in the air, um, there's a big chance that you're going to get hurt. So I find that danger really adds to my presence. <laughs> Some of the footage was shot more than two years previously and is cleverly blended in with the new material. Five and a half thousand tons of sand, cement, and tar. 250,000 feet of timber. 6,000 cubic yards of concrete. Half a million feet of scaffolding. 66,000 sheets of plywood. 10,000 square feet of glass helped to make up the $4 million spent on building New York's 42nd Street in England. The whole street was built in uh, pine wood. Uh, obviously, it was impossible to shoot in real Manhattan, which, of course, is metropolis, as we all know. But uh, you can't have people throwing buses at each other in the middle of the street where pedestrians are walking. I mean, it's impossible. So we had to build it. The designers had to create not only the real street, but two identical models as well. Using photographs taken from every conceivable angle, they remodeled skyscrapers that only needed to be high enough to fill the Panavision camera's lens. Right? The whole operation took 160 craftsmen 16 weeks. At the end of the street, they managed to save some money by painting a backdrop. This white line will never be seen in the film, but the artist just wanted to make it look perfect. The 30 lampposts had to be real. <laughs> but where there was a danger of a building or a shop coming under the camera's scrutiny, everything was fully recreated, down to the most minute detail. Just like the main street and countless westerns, this was to be the location of the major showdown between the good guy and the bad guys. But unlike countless westerns, here they're going to use more than bullets. Here, take the end of this. I 
actually lifted the bus up, and of course that enormous bus with 40 people in it has got a, a, a chain on it, and it's on a crane, that's how they, they do it. And it's hauled up, and as I lift it up, obviously the crane lifts it, the, the crane lifts the chain which lifts, lifts the bus, and the crane actually, the chain actually moved a fraction of an inch. There was a little bit of settlement, right? So, of course, I went on holding the bus. Instead of just relaxing my arms, you know, I went on holding it because I was superwoman. I was a superwoman for that minute. And afterwards, of course, I pulled all these, tore all these muscles here. You know, Richard said, you know, why did you go on holding it? And I said, well, for that split second, you know, that split second, you do believe that you have sort of extra strong extra strengths. Push their hands up if they can. Yeah, than, than but instead, instead, of, instead of pushing, if you, if you push that way from on action, instead of doing all that, yeah. three, two, one, go. Having shot the bus sequence on the life-size street, they did so again on the model unit, just for that split-second shot that would add an extra dimension of danger to the action. Once again, every minute detail had to look real and exactly mirror the exterior set. Yes, okay. yes. yes. to kill the, uh, the crack under the... Um, Can we put them all in now? Put them all in, Frank. Uh, 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 Stopped it that time. Yeah. Oh, it's this little guy's gonna take over for me in part three. I'm not coming in. <laughs> He's doing the whole thing. <coughs> no, I Cute. Haven't. I think it's incredible. Because this is exactly the way it was. I'm absolutely exactly, right down to the letter. Even even the window dressing in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're just <coughs> yeah. somebody's doll's house, I'm sure. Yeah, that place is great. When they, when we had on the back lot, we all we went in there trying to buy steak sandwiches and stuff. That's tremendous. I'll draw his fire. Some of my own. The explosions look real, and that's because they are real. Colin Childers and his special effects team have filled the cars with an explosive chemical called naphthalene, preparing each car for the exact way it will blow up. These cars have been prepared with the doors to go off, the bonnets and the trunk to come up, and big balls of flame. Um, because we've got lots of people around, we can't make it dangerous, and we've got to make sure there's no bits that fly or anyone gets hurt.
once one got onto the street, I found that it was very much like ordinary filmmaking because although the effects in that street were more like ordinary action filming. For example, there's a whole sequence where the villains blow, uh, use, use their super breath to, to, to create a kind of tornado that, that sweeps people down the streets. Once you know how to do that specific effect with one stuntman, it's very easy to ad lib. And in fact, in, in a period of three nights, we ad lib that whole sequence. Uh, and it wasn't something that had to be written out in advance. It was, and therefore, for me, it was, it was a delight. It was a joy to be able to go up and invent gags on the spot. A team of hundreds of crew and extras work night after night in near zero November temperatures to shoot and reshoot every aspect and angle of the chaos caused by the tornado from Krypton. The end product wasn't just a stunning piece of cinema magic. It was an example of the dedication of everyone, from stars and director down to tea ladies and carpenters, that has put the Superman films in a class of their own. Superman really that there was not one place where it didn't go well it go someplace better someplace much better but it's always done very well all of them wherever it went I think he I don't know if he exists I think he should exist <laughs> I don't think he could have made this movie in the 60s. Now, I feel, I may be wrong, but I feel a sort of a, a new kind of um, loyalty in, in America. I mean, a new, a new sort of perhaps patriotism where we feel it's not a bad thing. It's not embarrassing. It's not bad to say, okay, for our country sort of thing. And I never, I never thought of Superman as a, as a piece of American propaganda. I don't think him as being particularly American. He's just happened to land up in America. He might have landed in Russia, for God's sake. He might have landed in Alaska or, or Tibet. It doesn't matter. But to be able, in a movie, unabashedly have a leading figure come out and say that he's loyal to something and has an allegiance, to, that we can dare to put the ending on the film that we have, where Superman returns the American flag back to the White House. I mean, five years ago, I don't think we would have been caught dead doing that kind of thing. <laughs> Good 
afternoon, Mr. President. Sorry I've been away so long. I won't let you down again.